Good afternoon, everyone. It was a pleasure to be here back in Cortland. Um, okay. And Mecca, thank you very much for arranging this event. We've met before on different occasions here. Um, I'm calling this presentation today the Hancock Killer Drone. Are we the terrorists? Now, that might sound kind of provocative, and it's meant to be. Now, apart from Professor Nagel and, and my friend Dave Cashmere, uh, who brought me here, I don't know any of you yet. Um, so to remedy that, I'd like to put out some questions. Um, and I look forward to you asking me plenty of questions later. And I'm particularly interested in challenging questions, ones that'll clarify or push the issue further. Okay, let's begin. First, this word terrorism. <coughs> Haven't we all heard politicians and talking heads and newscasters invoke terrorism literally thousands and thousands of times? Since 9-11, it's been a drumbeat in our ears. But my guess is that few of us have ever heard the word defined. So, let's see if we can come up with some kind of definition. So who here would, would uh, get us, begin us defining terrorism? Yeah? Terrorism is the use of violent acts or any type of public activity that's been used to invoke terror on the public for the purposes of um, yeah, political life. Yeah, I think that's very close to what the State Department, their definition, well, what their former definition was anyway. Things have evolved in recent years uh, on the terrorism front in terms of semantics, in terms of definitions. So years ago when I started wondering about terrorism and trying to understand it, I came across the U.S. State Department definition. At that time, the State Department's definition went something very much like this gentleman said. Terrorism is the use of violence or the threat of violence against civilians for political purposes. Okay, let me just repeat that because it's so pivotal, I think. Terrorism is the use of violence or the threat of violence against civilians for political purposes. But no, something about that. That definition in its pithiness says nothing about race, religion, nationality, of the victims, or the perpetrators. It doesn't say anything about whether the terrorists are in or out of uniform. It doesn't say anything about whether they use low tech or high tech or whether they operate on the land, on the sea, or from the air. Now, I would expand that definition to include not only political purposes, but also suggest that violence is used for economic purposes. You can't really separate the political and the economic. For example, driving indigenous people off their land so you can raise cash crops there. Or mining mineral resources there. Or so you can settle that land. Certain states, the US, Australia, New Zealand, Connecticut, formerly South Africa, apartheid South Africa, Israel, currently, or historically, are settler colonial states. If you want to understand these nations' history, it's really important that you understand their settler colonial states. Did any of these settler colonial states prevail without using terrorism against the natives there? 
There's probably a good reason why the world's most capitalistic country is also the world's most militaristic country. No wonder our government doesn't acknowledge terrorism's economic aspect. Even apart from that added clarification, the word terrorism often gets used in a much looser fashion. But we can talk about that later. Here are some questions that may help us use the word more precisely and more inclusively. How do we know when someone or some group commits a terrorist act? Do only non-state actors perpetrate terrorism? Do only non-white people commit terrorism? Or can governments and uniform military perpetrate terrorism? Now, most of the time when I use the word terrorism, I put it in quotes, in my own mind anyway, because for me it's such a dicey term. Only so-called or self-described Islamic persons perpetrate terrorism. Obviously, sometimes they do. For example, we see on YouTube that ISIS occasionally beheads some of its prisoners. That seems pretty terroristic to me. Are US enemies the only ones who commit terrorism? <coughs> You might think so from our media, mainstream media. <coughs> our mainstream press seldom mentions it, but Saudi Arabia, our longtime ally, or I should say the U.S. is longtime ally, it's not necessarily my longtime ally, also officially beheads its condemned prisoners. But do we ever hear Saudi Arabia described as a terrorist state. When our other ally in the region, the Israeli Defense Force, the IDF, repeatedly bombs the people of Gaza, is it committing terrorism? The IDF calls such periodic bombing, using drones and other weaponry, cutting the grass. Powerful metaphor. Israel wants to make sure that the people of Gaza don't get very far in developing any infrastructure. Military planes often strike terror in those on the ground. Can other white people, even so-called Christians, commit terrorism? Like the soldiers at My Lai in Vietnam, or like those young men and women who a few years ago tortured prisoners at Abu Ghraib in Iraq, a mil military prison. Could they be said to have been terrorizing their prisoners? If you or members of your family or village or clan were being tortured, would you call that terrorism? Does terrorism only happen over there. What about Timothy McVeigh and the occasional mass shooters here? What about in the 19th century, the near extinction of the American Indian? Do only the winners get to define how we use the word terrorism? You know, it's often said that it's winners who get to write history. I'd like to now talk more specifically about Hancock Air Force Base. Hancock is on the edge of Syracuse, less than two miles east of Interstate 81, and only about an hour north of the SUNY Cortland campus. Among other military units, Hancock hosts the 174th attack wing of the New York National Guard. Now, whenever I write that, which is occasionally, I always put a tat wing in italics. Just imagine that instead of a tat wing, a military unit was called the rape wing. 
that be kind of disturbing? Well, any kind of attack is almost always some kind of violation or, you know, violation of human dignity, you know, violation of law. But they brazenly celebrate the name attack <laughs> at Hancock Air Base. It says something about their motivation. And the Hancock attack wing isn't the only such attack wing in New York State. There's another at the Niagara Air Force Base near Buffalo. They're both attack wings. Both, you know, state um, National, New York National Guard units. Both have MQ-9 Reaper drones. The military itself calls Reaper drones hunter killer. They take pride in this. Job one of 174th is to pilot MQ-9 hunter killer Reaper drones over the Middle East and West Asia, and, and probably elsewhere. Reaper drones are weaponized, remotely controlled assassins. Dave, do you have an image? There you go, beautiful. And there's another image too. Yeah. This is a, um, a Hellfire missile. It, it's a, a pretty deadly uh, armament. Now, were any of you in this room part of the thousand or so folks who took part in that huge, spontaneous, almost spontaneous demonstration a few weeks ago at Hancock International Airport, Syracuse International Airport. Any hands? Dave, I'm not surprised. Dave is, um, by the way, the chair of our local um, Veterans for Peace chapter in Syracuse, chapter 51, um, as well as pretty much of a oh, full-time um, you know, that, that demonstration with a thousand or so folks was protesting Mr. Trump's ban on refugees and others from the seven Islamic nations. Now, I wonder how many of those taking part in that wonderful show, People Power, understood that one reason there are so many Islamic refugees is that theirs is the region that the U.S. military and its proxies have been bombing the bejesus out of for years. Drones and other aircraft have been terrorizing and demolishing whole nations. Any examples? You know which those nations are? Syria. And particularly right now, what the nation is being destroyed by aerial warfare, by aerial terrorism. It's the smallest, I don't know if it's the smallest, but it's the poorest nation in that region. And it's being done by the Saudis who will get their weapons Yemen. from the U.S. Yemen. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Now, such bombing, what I call aerial terrorism, isn't the only cause of refugees, but it is a significant cause. Now, it happens if you were at that demonstration, or if you've ever flown out of Syracuse International Airport, you've been just around the corner from the Hancock drone base, which is the source of some of that horror happening in, happens in Libya, Iraq, um, Syria now, now, we don't know exactly where Hancock's Reaper drones are operating because it's secret. It's classified. But it's a fairly good guess that uh, they're not just staying within Afghanistan, which is where they admit to operating 24-7. Hancock's main entrance is at 6001 East Malloy Road in the town of DeWitt which is kind of, as you might know, sort of affluent suburbs, Syracuse. In fact, the International Airport 
and Hancock military base even share some facilities, like a hangar on runways. Now, do a shot of the, if there's one um, regular drone with the Hancock uh, hangar in the background. Yeah. Anyway, so a little history. Hancock was formerly an F-16 jet bomber base. As the F-16 grew increasingly obsolete, Hancock had to find a new mission. <coughs> Upstate congressmen kicked into lobbying mode and proposed the Hancock base. Around 2009, we began hearing reports that Hancock was becoming an MQ-9 Reaper drone hub, tasked with piloting hunter-killer drones via satellite lookup overseas. Hancock has also become the National Reaper Maintenance Training Center. In 2010, activists from around New York State and beyond formed a grassroots group, the Upstate Drone Action Coalition, sometimes called Ground the Drones and End the Wars. Now, what is a drone? Can someone tell us all about what a drone is. Some of its characteristics in a moment, hopefully, hopefully will. Yeah. Is it an aircraft without a pilot? An aircraft without a pilot? Yeah. They're, they're vehicles without a pilot or a driver. In this case, they're airborne, but do they have to be airborne? No, they can be on the ground, they can be underwater. The idea is that they are without a pilot on board. Any other characteristics of drones? Um, they're controlled by someone, like elsewhere. Louder, please. They're controlled by someone that's not in it. Any idea how that someone controls the drone? A remote. A remote. <coughs> I'm sorry, I don't hear too well. Remote. It's remote, con the remote control. There's no pilot on board, but through very high tech stuff, satellites, um, they're controlled by pilots or operators, for example, at Hancock Air Base. But also other bases, like I, I just mentioned the, the Niagara Base. Um, but, but there's several others around the country um, that control MQ-9 Reaper drones, you know, overseas. <coughs> And then there's other kinds of drones, too, that are controlled elsewhere. Okay. Um, now, drones are used for purposes both good and bad. They come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. The Reaper drone is one of the larger. And this is that, that, that shot we just had. This is like a cockpit, but it's not inside an airborne vehicle, it's like out at Hancock, or, or one of the other uh, drone bases, either here in this country or overseas. You know, typically there's an operator, and then there's like a, um, sorry? Payload operator. There's a payload operator and there's an air vehicle operator. Okay. Uh, actually, a sensor operator and no, a payload operator, a sensor pilot. Okay. <coughs> These guys, incidentally, it's not only males, it's males and females. Um, I think they work like 12 hour shifts, you know, pretty long shifts, pretty tiring shifts, I think. Um, so these drones I'm talking about today at Hancock, the MQ-9 Hunter Killer Reaper drone, is used for both military surveillance and assassination. They're, they're tactically very clever. There's some really good reasons why the military would want to use drones. Any, any thoughts about what those reasons might be? Yeah. They're cheaper to operate. Okay, they're cheaper to operate. There's no 
human on board, and uh, okay. Are they more targeting? Are, are they better at targeting? Yeah. Well, they've got some pretty sophisticated targeting um, cameras and equipment. Yeah. <coughs> now, the military says they're precise. They, they, they talk about this word precise a lot in their publicity. Um, but the fact is that a lot of others besides the target get killed, a lot of civilians, you know, women and children, non-combatants, and so forth. So you gotta kind of question that the word precise in this case. Yeah? Um, there's no risk of like a pilot being shot down? Yeah. For awesome reasons. Right. Or here in the U.S. Um, yeah, the pilot is, you know, in the uh, cockpit there, so to speak, uh, in the trailer out of hand. It's, it's totally safe. And there's no chance of being shot down or if there are accidents, um, you know, going down with the plane. So, that's, that's another point, that's an important point, because if you had an adversary that was only operating out of a place of total, total safety. Would you have much respect for that adversary? I mean, especially if it was killing and maiming. Do a response? Yeah. I mean, I understand. I mean, I've been in some of these countries, I've lived in some of these countries over the years, but I understand there's a feeling among some folks in the Islamic oil lands that it's a very cowardly kind of doing warfare. There's no risk. I mean, there's no like investment really in the income, in the outcome, personally. So, yeah. How does how does that affect um, like PTSD? Like, since there's no one over there, like that's obviously a big problem when people come back from like war and stuff. How does that affect like if you're not the one doing the kill? Like, would they get PTSD even though they're like so far away from behind a computer? Like. Do they feel that same those same effects that someone that's actually going over there, killing other people, like being in the risk? How does that affect that? Well, that's a very good question, um, and I'll try to answer it. Although I've never been a drone operator. <laughs> yeah. um, so the thing is, the thing is, you might be seven thousand miles away, but in a sense, you're like three feet away from the screen, and that screen is showing explosions and showing body parts. And maybe you've hovered over a particular target for hours or days or weeks, and you've maybe seen that target's family. What do you think it does to the human psyche when you kill someone? Do you think we just kind of roll with that pretty easily? Yeah. Very few people can roll with just killing. They, they've got to be conditioned to it. Um, and some people aren't so fully conditioned to killing their fellow human beings. So I understand PTSD is a problem with drone operators. It's, it's not only, you know, seeing the target, seeing the target blown up, but it's also, you know, I mentioned the 12 hour shifts and so forth. There's some real stress there with the workload, but also there's a stress that comes with being part of a machine that you can't talk about to anyone. You can't talk about it to your wife or your husband, your friends, it's classified. So you have these experiences. You see these killings, these maimings. You see people terrorized, but you can't talk about it, except perhaps maybe to a chaplain that has high security, who's paid by the military to help you adjust to what your job is. I mentioned that the drones are tactically clever. So we've, we've come up with some reasons why the military like, might like to use drones a lot more than even it can. And one reason it can is that people aren't volunteering to take these jobs at the rate that the military would like them to. Nor are drone operators 
volunteering to re-enlist as often as the military would like, despite really large bonuses for re-enlistment. It's, it's a pretty thankless job, I think, when you think about it. Sorry? What do? It's a very good one is that okay you take these skills that you have from your time of enlistment you can get jobs in private industry that pay much more so why are you enlist? Um, now I say that these Reaper drones are tactically very clever um, their surveillance technology is, is very impressive um, and, and they can do missions that a manned aircraft can't do. Um, they can do much more dangerous missions because there's no, no pilot, no crew that's taking <coughs> a risk. So they can take greater risks with the plane because the plane you know, is replaceable pretty readily. Um, also, if you don't have human crew, there's no one to screw up in the plane. There's no one to get fatigued, get tired. The drone can just keep going hour after hour after hour. Nor, well, one of the big problems during the Vietnam era was that soldiers began to resist the orders that they were being given. You know, they lost pride and belief in the mission. So they began resisting. They began mutinying. Well, with a drone, you don't have that problem at all. You know there's going to be total obedience coming out of that plane, of that drone. Now, I mentioned that drones strategically aren't so clever. Any thoughts as to why that might be? Well, I'll, I'll just throw out a couple reasons. <clears throat> Proliferation. You know, it was like with the atomic bomb back in the 40s. The US had the atomic bomb. No other countries could match it. It was really the king of the planet. But one problem with technology is that it spreads. So eventually, the Russians got the technology. Eventually, seven or eight or other countries have the technology. And then you eat in the, in the U.S. no longer had the monopoly on atomic, on atomic weaponry, or nuclear weapons. Well, that's coming to be the case also with drones. Many other nations, seeing how the U.S. uses drones, want their own. They want to keep up with the Joneses. So that proliferation um, can lead to problems for the defense of the U.S can lead to uh, the world being just much less safe. Another reason why drones strategically aren't so clever is blowback. Are, are people familiar with that term blowback? Anyone? Yeah. I mean, every action has an equal opposite reaction. That's kind of a rule in physics. So if a drone drops a cruise missile, a Hellfire missile, on a village, killing people, well, those villagers, the survivors, become prime recruits for those that oppose the US. Al Qaeda is often mentioned. That leads to, could lead to attacks on US interests. And there, there, so there's a payback that goes with drone attacks. It's called blowback. Now, 
Since 2010, our grassroots group, it's called our State Drone Action, has worked to expose the drone maiming and killing and terrorizing at Hancock. And, and these words, maiming, killing, terrorizing, are really just another way of saying war crime. What's being done by the US in several countries is illegal. It's war crime. After World War II, high-level war criminals were hung in the Nuremberg trials after World War II. Now, I don't imagine history will change that much in the next few years, but it could be that some of the leaders of this drone program and other aerial bombing will be hung one day for their crimes. Now, this maiming and killing happens without due process. Due process is one of the foundations of our Constitution. Now, because the Hancock operation is clandestine, we don't know where its drones operate. But we do know that US surveillance and killer drones operate against such fifth-rate powers as Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, Libya. Now these aren't formidable opponents, and yet we're using this very high tech to massacre the people, to assassinate the people in these countries. This is really bad karma, folks. These powers that I've just mentioned, these fifth-rate powers, don't begin to have the wherewithal to invade the US. And that's really a justification for having a military, is to defend your own borders, to defend your own people. And these target countries aren't a threat to US people. Now, what upstate drone action does is it kind of focuses on the personnel at Hancock. Um, what we hope is that with our demonstrations, we will get the personnel at Hancock thinking about this death machine that they're part of. And at least, you know, won't re-enlist or, or won't go into you know, private drone use. Or if they go into private drone use jobs, that they won't be warlike, that they'll be maybe commercial. Yeah? Have you seen the film Eye in the sky. Yeah. What do you make of it? Well, I did find it engaging, um, but I think what it did is set up some artificial situations, and it showed um, the allies handling them with great sensitivity. You know, whether to drop a bomb, whether to save a child that might get in the way, that kind of thing. But I think basically it was kind of a a, a false situation that was being set up in that film. It was a very good film, technically, and in terms of you know production values, but there was certain falseness about it for me. I don't know, yourself. I have no background experience, but I thought it was a good film. I just wanted to hear your opinion. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I was very glad to see it. You know, I used to live in Kenya, so you know I've seen those slums there. And, um, have some feel for the country. So yeah, and there's a number of other films too, like a half a dozen other films and documentaries about drones that you can you can watch, and um, I think they can enrich your understanding of drones. But you gotta be very careful about some of the assumptions they're making, where they're setting you up to sort of believe. Yeah, but you mentioned particular proliferation early, right? Particular. Um, you mentioned proliferation. Proliferation, yeah. Proliferation, right? And in the case of nuclear weapons, I mean, the U.S. hasn't used them since 1945 in Japan, right? Well, I can, I can qualify that. Maybe. I, I will. I will. I will. Maybe, I'd love to hear the qualification. But, yeah. but part of the reason a lot of persons would argue is 
nuclear assured destruction. So because China and Russia and Israel, Pakistan, India, France and the UK, mm -hmm. because they all have um, nuclear weapons, then mm -hmm. the nuclear armed states aren't going to use them in warfare. So maybe if China, by the same reason, you know, um, I can't remember the word that they use, but just, you, I can't remember the word. But the point is, first no, not first strike. But the point is, if China now gets drones, and a lot of other countries that are rich enough to afford drones, now get these drones, maybe even Saudi Arabia, would the US military think twice before using it on third world countries or second world countries? Well, um, let, let me back up. And you were suggesting that we haven't used nuclear weaponry since August 6, and August 9, 1945. In fact, nuclear weaponry is used at least in two ways. One, there's a lot of testing of nuclear bombs, whether it be in the Pacific, or in Nevada, Arizona, which has an impact on our environment. Also, nuclear weaponry is a form of blackmail. If you have one superpower with nuclear weapons, you gotta be pretty careful about resisting that superpower. It can obliterate you. And it's already showed in Japan in 1945 that it's quite willing to do that. Which is why North Korea wants to get into so many nuclear weapons. Right? As a deterrent. That's the word. Deterrence. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, kind of the same argument you use with drones. Would they use the drones as deterrence? I mean, I, I, I can picture situations in which deterrence becomes a factor, but the power that has the most nuclear capacity, the most drone capacity, has a lot more power in this world than otherwise, just from the threat of using these devices. Like, the assassin drones can go anywhere on the planet. It can target any leader on the planet pretty readily. Now, if you're a leader, you're going to think kind of twice about um, tweaking the nose of Uncle Sam. Mm -hmm. Which is why you want to get your own drones. You want to get your own drones. Or why you might want to just couch out to the U.S. Empire. Yeah, but even if 90% of the world does that, always going to be a minority who disagree with the U.S. and, you know, have a spine on their own and decide that we're going to do our own thing. And yeah, I mean, there's a number of nations that have resisted the U.S. and disagree with the U.S. and never vote with it, like, in, in the, in the um, General Assembly in the U.N. There's a lot of hostility out there toward the U.S., the U.S. power structure. Um, so that's not really helping the U.S. interests. To, to be so friendless in this world. Now, certainly his friends that want to ally with his power, you know. I mean, power does draw allies of a sort, um, but it also creates a lot of enemies. And when you depend, when, when your foreign policy depends on naked power, that, that probably works in some situations, but I bet there's other situations I mean, how about diplomacy? Because the U.S. has had so much power since 1945 with the nuke and now with the drones, its, it's ability to be diplomatic seems to have rusted away. But is there diplomacy without power? Hmm? Do you have, don't you have to have power behind diplomacy to, to back up their diplomacy? I mean, it sure helps. Why, why would they yeah. want to negotiate with you right. if you can't do anything? So, so we are looking at a lot of real politics now yeah. um, com coming out of Washington, and uh, we had a speaker um, last week who talked about, um, uh, you know, a peace studies scholar, you know, uh, that Trump is basically um, giving us blunt language, which has been uh, there before, you know, the, in terms of war politics, right, in, in disguised terms, humanitarian terms, right, you may want to speak about that, you know, uh, in terms of why was Afghanistan a target in the beginning, right? Um, and some of the coding was, we're going to save the girls. And the, 
women, right? From the Taliban, right? So there was this ready-made um, group to be hated, you know, that was aligned, you know, sort of aligned with the power structure, and then that justified killing, right? Um, I want to go to another point of view, since we have the lovely globe here. Um, do you want to highlight Djibouti? Do you know what it is? Right? Yeah, right, right here. Here we go. Djibouti, right? Which is basically um, belongs in, in, in large part to the US uh, war machine. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's very important in terms of refueling, right? Uh, and anyway, uh, so, you know, uh, uh, that's one part. But there's also Africa. You heard it? Because you live in Africa, right? So, um, there, there has been some resistance um, to align uh, with the U.S. war machine um, by the uh, countries in, on the African continent. So that um, the German town Stuttgart, uh, last I checked, was the headquarters of Africa even though Stuttgart is not exactly on the continent of Africa, right? But there's a liability associated with hosting a strategic command center, right, of the magnitude that the U.S. Um, demands be, uh, over and above of being, the, you know, a base, you haven't talked about, you know, the at least 100 bases around the world that the U.S. also owns, you know, so only on, op occupying on foreign land just like Guantanamo. So having a command center that is in Stuttgart, right, instead of uh, on Africa, on African soil, is basically the David approach to the Goliath. You know, the feeble attempt to say, you know, we don't want that kind of burden on our society right? and the threats that come, the destabilizing that comes. From it. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I think when you're occupied by a superpower, mm -hmm. um, that creates dynamics within your country that aren't democratic, and it could be quite volatile. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I'm, I'm also just wondering if um, what you can say about the drones um, that are sent you know, to middle, um, you know, Asian countries, Middle Eastern, African countries, Somalia, um, what about the refueling? You know, in Africa, I mean, I don't know any of that technical. Or is it, do they land in Djibouti and then? Well, or maybe they, land, they land in kind of a predator and reaper landing country. I don't know whether they're operating in country, but predator and reaper can be land, uh, controlled from like Las Vegas is the main place mm -hmm. to land from. Yeah. Uh, but they have guys on the ground in Afghanistan or wherever they are that it'll land, mm -hmm. they'll refuel, do all the maintenance, and then send it back up. Mm -hmm. And then the guys just switch in Las Vegas and they were near Las Vegas. They switch out seats basically right now. Mm -hmm. It's just how it rolls. They do in country, the maintenance guys are in country, mm -hmm. some operators are in country, and all the other areas are in foreign country. The UAV is what? Uh, I'm not yeah. Yeah. Um, I just want to make a point, and then we'll go to Dave, and then sure. catch up. Okay. Um, you mentioned Stuttgart. Mm -hmm. uh, are you familiar with the Ramstein yeah. base in Germany? Well, Ramstein is one of these very important hubs in the satellite system for um, piloting drones. You know, it's this huge base in Germany. I understand there have been protests there against the U.S. drones in the tens of thousands, maybe more. Um, yeah. So, Dave, did you want to make a point? Um, yeah, just a quick point. Um, I was look at the map, I was here on a U, uh, U.S. Uh, aircraft carrier in 1979, half a year, and 1980 And we, we received all of our supplies from Jubilee. Uh, we established, as far as I know, that was our, the entire country was the U.S. military supply base. I'm sure it is. I hear about it. Yeah. yeah, I was going to ask, do you really believe that the head of state of the USA is going to be tried for war crimes with the drone program? It, it, 
doesn't look that way now, but it didn't look that way for a lot of you know Hitler's lieutenants back in the early 1940s either. And yet a number of them were eventually hung for their war crimes. Yeah, but that's because they lost. Yeah. Well, I mean, who's going to defeat the USA? Or China for that matter? Or Russia? Yeah. I mean, we don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. Um, but you know, they say that the arc of the universe bends toward justice. If that's the case, there's a lot of leaders in the West that, that better be shaking in their boots. But if you look at the ICC, most of the persons that prosecute are tin pot dictators from the African continent. Well, oh, yeah, the, the International Court. Yeah, their roster of bad guys comes a lot from Africa, which is kind of an interesting uh, bias. Interesting because. Mm -hmm. yeah. Disturbing. I mean, it's part of the colonial regime. Am I getting other hands that want to acknowledge? Yeah. I have a question. Good. So does North Korea, do they not have nuclear weapons or do they? The Koreans don't. But they, South Korea has this. Okay, so I was saying that our group, Upstate Drone Action, and I should say something about Upstate Drone Action. Um, it's made up mostly of activists, anti-war, anti-militarist activists from around New York State, uh, but also beyond New York State, from several other states. And this is a grassroots organization. There's no real leader of it. There's no real headquarters of it. Um, we, we meet periodically, like maybe every, I don't know, five or six weeks, often in a different city, like Ithaca or Buffalo or Rochester. Often in Syracuse because we're so close to Hancock. Um, and we have three active members from New York City and elsewhere beyond. Uh, there's no paid staff, but we've been operating since 2010. <coughs> we focus primarily on Hancock Air Base in our demonstrations, um, but as I mentioned, there's still another Reaper base in New York State called Niagara Base, which has Reapers also. Now, my sense is that a lot of the drone operators are naive, they're idealistic, they're pretty young. So what we hope is that somehow we could reach their consciences so that we, we don't have direct communication with these personnel. But twice a month we're out there in front of the main gate across the road with our signs, hoping that as they come off shift, they will see the signs and think about what the signs say. And presumably, there's some conversation, some buzz that goes on in the base among the personnel, um, which in itself may awaken questions in their mind about what they're doing. The ideal personnel, ideal employee, would be someone that doesn't think at all. It's a robot. But hopefully we're sort of unroboticizing these young people who have been conditioned to think in particular terms that allow them to participate in drone warfare. Now, we're not only trying to reach the personnel on the base. You know, we have signs like, drones fly, children die, mm -hmm. um, and a whole range of other signs. But 
we're also trying to awaken the public to the drone situation. Pretty much the public is kind of oblivious about drones um, and, and haven't been helped by our mainstream media to think through the ethical or even the strategic implications of drones. Um, so our signs where they tend to be directed toward the personnel coming off the base in the afternoon shift change. There's also a lot of traffic that goes back and forth along East Malloy Road in the town of Malloy. And, you know, we help hope that, um, you know, they're looking at our signs too. And judging by some of the reactions, uh, they certainly are. Um, we do get thumbs up. We, we get, you know, beeping of honk, honks, beeping of horns, which I take as affirmation and support. Of course, we also get the finger. And we get people driving by, you know, shouting. But you can't hear them because they drive by so fast. We'd love to have them stop and talk with us. That's what I'd really like to have happen, but it, it happens pretty rarely, actually. Um, now, Upstate Joint Action uses a diversity of tactics, all of them strictly nonviolent. In fact, we've all signed a pledge about nonviolence before we've done actions at the base that might risk arrest. Um, and most of the different tactics we use are conventional and legal, like leafleting and showing films and having teach-ins and street theater. We've lobbied Congress. We've demonstrated the White House. Now, twice a week, Tuesday afternoons and Saturday mornings, we're out there with our signage. Now, Saturday morning, we're not out at the base. We're at the regional market in Syracuse. But there's a lot of traffic also to go by. So we, we demonstrate around busy intersections in Syracuse and on Water County. Now, roughly twice a year since 2010, a little more than that, um, we've gone across the road onto the base side of East Malloy Road. And using our bodies and various props, we, we, we block the entrance. Um, just the main entrance, usually, but we have blocked all three entrances. So these kind of cheeky actions invariably result in arrests, um, and often trials in the DeWitt Town Court, and incarcerations. Now, I'm going to say more about those. We're charged with trespass, uh, disorderly conduct, and something called obstruction of government administration. Often these charges are bogus. Now, Dave has pulled together some, uh, some images to give you an idea of some of the actions that we've done at Hancock. That one just now. Can we get that one back? These are three of us on crosses on Good Friday. You know, in the Catholic tradition, that's when Jesus was crucified. So to mark Good Friday, we're suggesting the drones are actually a form of crucifixion for their victims. You know, back during Roman times, the Roman Empire that controlled Palestine, back in the era when, when Jesus was preaching, the Romans had, had crosses lining the roads. It's, it's what they did with dissenters, criminals, but it was a form of terrorism. Those Roman crosses weren't only to punish bad guys, they were to terrorize the population. To say, hey, we are so powerful, you can't rebel against us. So we did that on Good Friday. We, we had the three, the three crosses here. But then we also had 11 other crosses. And each one carried a message. Uh, each one says, drones crucify. And then there's words on the vertical, like drones crucify peace, drones crucify families, drones crucify the rule of law, crucify community, crucify due process, going the wrong way, crucify love, and so forth. So there were 14 of us. Um, and it turned out that when the police came, as they invariably do, after a while, 
Um, they say, you gotta leave or you'll be arrested. Well, a bunch of us don't leave. And we get arrested. Dave, you wanna have some of our, our other images and some of our other actions there? So that's the main gate, and in the background you can see some aircraft. And when we show up, and we bring these crosses like in a U-Haul uh, trailer, and uh, we hop out of the trailer and set them up. Uh, on December 23rd, around Christmas time, we did a um, nativity scene. And I don't know if you can see the language in the background, but it says, if Herod had drones, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph would have been incinerated. And then we have uh, Mary, Jesus, and Joseph. And that's one of the three kings. Uh, so I think it was like, on that one, there were, uh, I think, four of us arrested. Dave, let's go with another one. so-called Jerry Berrigan Memorial Drone Blockade. So there's, I'm not sure how many of us were there, maybe 20. These are all like cardboard cutouts, life-size, of Jerry Berrigan. Now Jerry Berrigan died a couple years ago, um, around the age of 95. But until he was about 94, he would come out to Hancock with us every time, weather permitting, you know, he's a frail. He used to teach at Hondog Community College, teach English. And uh, he had a couple of famous brothers, the Berrigan brothers, uh, who were known for doing very dramatic actions. Like during the Vietnam War, they, um, they went into a, a draft board and brought out all the draft files and set them on fire with that bomb. And of course, they went to prison for this, you know, several times. Here's Jerry back in, um, well, it was back during when, when Iraq, when the Iraq War was hot. We, we did this action in downtown Syracuse, um, right on Salina Street, the main street of Syracuse. And here's Jerry being arrested. Um, obviously, it doesn't face him very much to be arrested. And uh, this, this is actually taken from a postcard of Jerry. Um, I love the expression of the cop's face. I mean, my guess is that for a cop to arrest like a 93-year-old man isn't very satisfying, especially a man you know, very widely beloved in Syracuse, in certain quarters. Yeah. Okay. Um, what, what else we have, Dave? Yeah, yeah, I do want to get into, so those, that'll give you some of the idea of the street theater that we've done, and uh, so, I, so I would like to talk a little about um, the consequences for us. Uh, so invariably we're arrested, sometimes it takes them an hour or two to kind of get it together. Uh, the state troopers arrive, the DeWitt police arrive, the, um, I don't know, the sheriffs arrive, they talk a lot to one another and figure out what to do with this. Um, one thing I want to emphasize is that all of our actions, oh, here's our big books action. Yeah. Uh, I'll get back to that. Let's keep that in this, um, Dave. All of our actions are strictly nonviolent. We're, we're very orderly. Um, when we're taken away by the authorities, you know, we go very meekly. We're, we're not giving any trouble. You know, we're not. Um, making them drag us away or anything like that. Um, now this, this action was we have these, there's several books that we decided would be really significant for our issue. Uh, 30 Wars by Jeremy Scadle. 
that book is a, it's a thick, very intensely researched book, you know, maybe five, six hundred pages about the drone war and about JSOC, you know, which is these small, very highly trained units that kind of go behind the lines and do their sabotage and their assassinations and so forth. Um, living under drones, I should have brought some copies because I'd like to get these out into circulation. It's by the Stanford Law School and by New York University Law School. They, a team, went to Pakistan back in 2012 and to interview drone survivors and to gather facts. So this is their report. It's about 160 pages. It's very clear. It's well written. It's very well documented and based on law. I mean, Stanford and NYU are you know top flight law schools. Um, so if you want to learn about drones in a hurry. This book, Living Under Drones, is a way to start, I think. Um, and it's downloadable. You can download it for free. What we've done in Syracuse is uh, we, we took, we, we engaged a printer who's a friend of ours, and he, and he printed these up and bound them. So they're like, you know, books. I, like, I really should have brought some with me um, to spread the word. Uh, also, Charter of the United Nations, which, you know, the U.S. and I don't know how many other countries, 160 or something, have signed. This is international law. U.S. law is subservient to international law. And it calls basically for the abolition of, of, of aggression, of war, of attacking. Um, so that charter is very important as part of our legal case when we go to court. Um, let me see if I can, there, there's another book in here, if I can remember it. <coughs> oh, it's, uh, you, you never drop, you never die twice, which is by Reprieve, which is a British human rights organization. It, it, it's a study of particular targets, a number of targets, and whether they got killed or not, and how many civilians were killed along with them. And it turned out from their study that for every consciously, deliberately targeted bad guy, like nine civilians were killed. Now sometimes the targeted bad guy, it would be reported, well, we got him. You know, we killed him. And then embarrassingly, maybe a few weeks later, he emerges. So he gets targeted again. And again, an average of nine civilians get killed. So they have, you never do die twice as those kinds of statistics. So it's a very illuminating kind of study of, of, of how the drones really aren't as precise as the Pentagon PR term, PR team, would have us believe. Um, questions so far? Yeah. So I'm with you on all the human rights issues, right? I said I'm with you on all the human rights issues. Okay. But what would you like guys like to see done? Like, end goal. What do you want to see? Bottom line. In terms of drones on the US. Yeah, my ideal would be that weaponized drones be illegal worldwide. Never been well, I can work toward it. I mean, they say that about some other things, like chemical warfare is supposed to be illegal. Um, in certain quarters, cluster bombs. There's been real strong efforts to make cluster bombs illegal. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a goal worth working for. Uh, I don't see how that's going to happen politically. Well, it is hard to see. I mean, once you have a weapon like that, it saves lives, quote unquote, because you don't have to put a pilot in there. So that's one justification. I know it's bad reason, but it's still reason. Yeah, it is. And there's a lot of resistances. I mean, there's a lot of good reasons, tactically clever reasons for cluster bombs. In fact, that's why they're still used in some situations. Um, you know, probably in 1820, no one would believe that in 45 years, slavery would be abolished. But 
Eventually it was. I mean, times change. People's world values but change. Well, there's a difference because slavery is human behavior. Mm -hmm. Drones is technology. Once you discover technology, you can't discover it. But you can direct, you can channel it in different directions. Well, it's still there. That's the thing. It's still there. So how do you tell it? All right, so you can't put the genie back in the bottle, I think is what you're saying. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. But in the U.S. at least, you have some checks and balances, right? I'd like to think so. You like to think so, right? Yeah. But how do you tell a country like China, where the leaders of China they don't give a shit for anyone, as you say, and they give protests they lock your bottom up. When those guys do the drones, how do you tell them that they're not, they're not going to use them? Well, you, you make a treaty with them. You say, okay, you agree not to use your drones, your weaponized drones, We'll agree not to use our weaponized drones against you. Treaties. But they break treaties all the time. Yeah. I just don't see how it's true. That people don't use, have the weapon and not use it. Well, I mean, they claim, and, and you said it yourself, that the atomic bomb hasn't been used since 1945. I mean, it is in some ways, but nonetheless, it hasn't been exploded over civilians except, you know, islanders in the Pacific who don't matter. Um, no. I mean, one way we can save your argument is to say, um, you know, the, the old peace slogan is, what if there war and nobody went there, right? I'm translating from German. Very close. So the question is, uh, can they develop a more terrifying drone technology where they don't even use pilots anymore? So you really have authoritarian... Uh, Autonomous. Yeah. Weaponry, yeah. That that's, that's a scary that prospect. Be, because by now, what you, what I'm seeing, um, the positive effects of your action, symbolic as it mm -hmm. is, right? Um, you know, educating us and, you know, seeing, you know, Travis Scott was onto something for talking about the PTSD that is not imagined. The drone operators are now organizing um, nationwide, right, against drone war, right? And so, if we can mobilize more people to see this is not sanitized warfare, it's still chaos, right? The collateral damage, you know, and, and dramatizing war in terms of children and saving the children, right? And women, for good measure, is always something that strikes um, most of us with sympathy and horror that this um, can go on, right? Thank you, exactly, the trauma is real. Right? Dave forwarded me a number of images of, of dead children. You know, they're not pretty at all. Here, I have a two-part question. One, um, following into a lot of the conversation there. So to get the drone stopped, just like the nuclear war, bombs aren't being used, but other technologies developed. Stopping the drones won't end the problem. <clears throat> you outlaw guns, people use knives, and so forth and so on. Um, as far as the drones go, I mean, do you really think you're winning? or we're winning, however you want to put that. I know the Air Force has announced something like another 3,500 pilots and operators by 2020. They're up in their Lackland school to where they can do something like seven or 800 kids, uh, literally kids, 78 year olds, going through the school and becoming pilots and operators. I mean, it looks like there's more and more and more. And all the things that are shown as benefits of a drone program are being taunted much more and vociferously. You know, you guys are out there, you know, books and crosses and stuff like that, but the Defense Department and the President of the United States and lots of other people are out there with a bigger big, budget than we big, have. Bigger guns, pardon, yeah. pardon the term. But, yeah. Um, do you really think I mean, that even if you succeed, that they won't just turn to something else? Yeah. Oh, I, I think they probably will turn to something else. Uh, you know, I don't. That's I mean, part of, is part of the, the thing with the drones, I know, and, and Mecca had mentioned this, was the, the concept of a non-controlled, non-piloted, autonomous non operate. We have that. We've had that for decades. We've gone away from that. The drone program was sort of a replacement for that because it didn't work. When you look at the autonomous of cruise missile, it's a GPS guided. You push a button, it goes and it does its thing. We have all that. We've gone away from that um, in a lot of sense is because of the, the social blowback from mm -hmm. countries that we've been bombing the crap out of for better than a half a century now. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're, we're looking towards 
this is our salvation, and that's the way it's being presented publicly. Mm -hmm. This is how we have a war without losing our sons and daughters and brothers and sisters in, in, in combat. So PTSD, we can handle, we can treat that, we can deal with that. And, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the attitude about the war in general in the United States. Now, I, I'm looking, the second part of my question now is I'm now, now, can you give me a oh, I'm question sorry. sentence form that I can kind of maybe yeah. better respond to? I'm horrible about that. But, yeah, I mean, honestly, I guess that's the root of that question. I mean, do you really think we're winning or that we can see um, in the lifetime of my lifetime, your lifetime, or the youngest student in this class, success in this matter without it just being redirected to a different form of killing? Well, I think redirection definitely happens. And I'm not an optimist. Um, things may get worse, but our effort to make it not so bad, our effort to reduce the suffering, and I think that's worthwhile. And then also, to the extent that we're ethical beings, you know, we do what we do because it's right. You know, because our conscience tells us that some of these war systems are, are um, immoral and cause a lot of suffering. Could I make a statement about PTSD? Yeah. Please. I'm a U.S. Navy veteran, uh, six years active, and I've been diagnosed with PTSD by the VA, Department of Veterans Affairs, I'm service connected, disability. Um, you made a statement that PTSD well, I'm also service connected with PTSD, 18 years infantry. Oh, um, right. I've been in Iraq and several other places as yeah. well in direct combat. Um, that's not necessarily my attitude. Um, even though I do believe PTSD can be handled and treated, that's the general scope of people in power, their attitude. Oh, well, we'll just give them some therapy, we'll hire some new pilots, and we'll move on. That's the point I was making. That's that. the problem with war. I mean, so much trauma involved, not only uh, uh, U.S. military uh, service members, but victims of war. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my uh, issues are with the victims of war, with what I did, and, and I, it's, it's hard to forgive yourself uh, once you commit an atrocity on uh, a child. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, and I think that's kind of yeah. what, I would, what I was saying about the way drones are seen as our salvation, because they push that sadness, that horrific side of war away so that we don't see it. We've already gone that way a lot in the United States in our entire history. We haven't suffered, except for the Civil War, directly from war very much. And this is one more step to pushing, you know, pushing that away. Well, drones are good for uh, keeping uh, uh, civilian casualties uh, Federal damage out of the media, mm -hmm. out of our minds. Uh, drones are good for that. And uh, if most of the missions are over, so we don't know really. Uh, I mean, you take a look at where we're using drones Yemen, Somalia, Pakistan, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, maybe Iran, I don't know, but uh, Syria. It's difficult. I know the, the Air Force program, um, which is the largest program, of course, for the Army and civilian so there's a lot of other drone programs too, the Air Force program. Um, I know they tout the um, the remote pro remote piloted aircraft program, I think the actual official term for the Air Force. They tout it as the only part of the Air Force that's 100% active 100% of the day. Meaning that they have something like 1,500 pilots and operators who are always working, always on call. They're not deploying for six months and coming home. At any given moment in the United States, they're all doing their job, flying drones, surveilling, blowing stuff up, whatever the case might be. Um, and that, that's huge to think about the amount of things that are going on right now with that number 
that there's something like right now 700 or something drones in the air doing something at the somewhere point. with a range of something like 2400 kilometers or something like that without refueling isn't that what it is for the reaper um so i mean it's it's a big deal i know they're talking about now building a base in syria and i, I believe that's probably for refueling and maintenance operations so that they can continue that operational pace um you know and that's that's a large scope that we're dealing mm -hmm. with. And sure, every drone, if you can keep one from flying today, that's one person that might not die today. Uh, maybe they'll die tomorrow, but at least they get to live another day. You know, that's that's the person hold. on which end? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always them, it's not us. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's well, the political we're, We are killing the roundabout of it. But I just want to point out, if you look at this, the tail of this thing, is mm -hmm. in New York? That's National Guard. Supposed to be under command and control of the, the New York State, the, the governor. But what has happened? They um, activated the New York, the 174th attack wing. Seriously, they are flying active missions right now overseas. But that's National Guard. Mm -hmm. And you say Air Force? Is it Air Force? What is it? Mm -hmm. Well, it's the Air National Guard. When they're activated, they fall under the command of the Air Force. Yeah, they're activated the Air Force. Force. But, but, uh, yeah, the 174th has been activated since they were F-16s. I know that. I used to go to Hancock. I was part of the 27th BCT right there. Well, Hancock, also. Um, so. Sabers, so. Yeah. yeah. We got a question in the far back. In the mid-year. So you mentioned that part of your um, group's tactic is to um, appeal to the empathy of the drone operator. So my question is, what do we know about the drone operators? Um, and I think that appealing to empathy, it's gonna be, you're gonna have variable results depending on where people are coming from. If I'm in a situation, you know, you take the, the classic example, if I'm on the streets and I'm starving, I will do whatever it takes to get my next meal. So with that mentality, that's a human condition. Now I can't imagine that our drone operators are necessarily in those dire straits. Um, but this idea of appealing to the empathy, you know, we can talk about Maslow's hierarchy, if you will. You know what I mean? If you're, depending on where you are, this idea of, you know, um, a higher consciousness <laughs> might not be effective. Yeah, it, it may not affect most, but already there have been whistleblowers among drone operators. And as a result of their whistleblowing, we understand this machine better. And, and films have gotten made that reach tens of thousands, maybe more people, help them to better understand it. So what I hope is that more whistleblowers would come forward. And you don't, you don't need a lot to expose what's going on. I mean, there's a reason this program is kept so secret. I mean, if it was an honorable program, uh, there wouldn't be a need for such secrecy as much. Okay. And, and, and I don't, maybe it's just terminology, but I, I refer to conscience as opposed to empathy, but that can be quick. Can I add one other thing? You mentioned that uh, the, the military members are not suffering uh, as far as being hungry. Uh, the lower lower ranks of the U.S. military are eligible for food stamps. So, you know, that's there is such thing as a poverty draft. A lot of people go into the military because there aren't other opportunities. There aren't other jobs out there. So okay. there's there's multiple things I want to talk to um, talk about. Really insightful. Thank you for sharing your testimony. Um, there seems to me a, um, you've all heard of the school to prison pipeline, right? One way of evading is like, okay, if you're a good kid, you know, you get your high school diploma, well, maybe the military will be the, your path, and then you can get your college a degree for free, right? Wouldn't that be a wonderful world, right? If you weren't going to war, of course, and sign, signing up for that. But what I'm seeing, and speaking of, of, of Dave's comment here, that we also see the military to prison pipeline, right? And we've seen it uh, and definitely since uh, Vietnam in, in larger terms, right? Um, 
And so that's that's one aspect that there's an impoverization actually um, that the military will not provide you know a luxury afterlife you know uh, after the military right um, and one thing that is um, also disturbing is uh, <clears throat> I know from the soldiers like yourself John who served um, and like Dave um, and other members of the audience um, you know were deployed. You know, on the ground, right? Iraq and elsewhere. Um, I believe the stats that I've seen was that um, the you know killings, you know, of, uh, enemy fires, so being killed in, in warfare or maybe even by friendly fire, um, is surpassed by the suicides of returning soldiers coming back to the U.S. and taking their life for you know. And this is again taking issue with the ideology. I think, John, you were very careful um, to frame it. The ideology that PTSD, you know, once it's recognized, we can we can treat it. Well, no. There's horrors you've experienced, you know, that are not treatable. Right? Um, and so, for that reason, um, you know, in part, you know, there's there's a suicide, there's the pipeline to prison. The Obama administration set up the veterinary courts, right, as a way of diversion of seeing that veterans who commit petty crimes or or ghastly crimes like murder, you know, domestic violence is also in many uh, military towns a major uh, issue, right, social problem. Um, so instead of being condemned to a life sentence in prison, right, to use mitigating factors such as PTSD. And using um, veterinary, uh, uh, veterans justice administrators, as we have in Cortland County, right? that person will come to jail, right? Um, and if I'm alerted, um, you know, I will uh, about a person uh, being a, a veteran, veteran of war. I will alert the justice administrator myself to get them services in jail, to be bailed out, and or to get an release and then a, a treatment bed in, in the uh, veterans hospital. Right? So these services are now put together by the government that sees the explosion of suicides and drug addiction and mental health and you know, multiple diagnoses, not just two of diagnoses. Right? And so there's actually a question coming up. <laughs> my, my question then with drone operators, do we see a similar kind of combat um, issues of, you know, of, of suicide, or is it because it's top secret and maybe the whistleblowers won't go there and tell us, or it's also anecdotal, we don't know? There is uh, anecdotal I mean. references to suicide by drone operators. Mm -hmm. um, this book, this film that just came out, National Bird, oh. which um, has the stories of whistleblowers drone operator whistleblowers. There was a woman, actually, we talked with her day. I think Lisa, Lisa Wink, uh, Lisa Wink. She talked about knowing of at least two suicides by yeah. drone operatives. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think it's anecdotal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So films, that's what I wanted to ask you about. So earlier I asked you about uh, I understand, I think you yeah. asked, and he, I can't remember your name, sir, but hey. you you mentioned that um, one of the tricks that the military uses is to keep war, images of war, out of the, the minds of the public because it's not shown on, on CNN, for example. And so young people, they don't know what's going on. So what what is being done to promote this being shown in films? You know, Are there people investing in making movies, blockbusters about the U.S. drone program? You know, that seems like a much, much, much more strategically using mm -hmm. way to fight this thing. You mean the outside of the drone program? Just show it for what it is yeah. in yeah. movies. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone doing that kind of thing? Would anybody go to the movie? And, yeah. Well, if it's well written on it. Yeah, there's a handful of documentaries about drones that are out there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, people but, have. But, but you don't want just documentaries. You want movies that 18 to 22 year olds are going to watch, that college kids are going to watch. Yeah. Well, I, I think I a think correlation of that would be Black Hawk Down. Yeah. yeah. Black Hawk Down was a pretty graphic representation of a great failure that mm -hmm. increased military recruitment rates by something like 75%. Uh, 
Um, so does that work is a question. Putting it out there in the context of, hey, this stuff's really bad, this is what it's like. What, because we, we deal with a lot of those sociological factors like Becca was talking about. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of people that go in the military because they need a job. Yeah. You know, they need an escape. They can't go to college. They have bad families, uh, dysfunctional families, bad families, um, you know, and stuff like that. Um, yeah. When you look at like the drone operators, they get some, like $25,000 signing bonus when they go to school. Mm. It's, it's yeah. enticing. What, 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 what? Black Hawk Dome showed Somali is killing a U.S. soldier, dragging his naked body mm -hmm. along the ground. And I imagine that young Americans would have been outraged by that. That's why a lot of people want to sign up for that. Politicized on both, both sides. Yeah, mm -hmm. but, but at the same time, they show something for Americans to be outraged at, right? Um, I remember, I wanted to join the military as a teenager, believe it or not. And I saw Born on the 4th of July when Tom Cruise lost his legs, and I was like, no freaking way am I going to do this. You know, and I think films is a useful way to get people to realize what the military life is all about. Mm -hmm. and, you know, the deterrent from getting involved in this kind of thing. It's tricky. And yeah, I mean, I remember I was in the Marines in the infantry when Born on the Fourth of July came out, and we celebrated that as a military victory. That, that we we saw the good in that, and a lot of people did. Um, and said, "Oh, he lost his leg, but he's a great hero." That's the way it works. That's both ways. You know, it's, it's like Ed, I think it was Ed was saying, I mean, there are really very few people out there that like to kill, that want to kill, that get up in the morning and say, oh, I don't feel like killing some people today. But pretty much the entire human population, everyone in this room included, has the ability to justify doing it for a reason. And those reasons are presented very professionally by a lot of people. Um, Words are very carefully framed, and images are very carefully tailored. I mean, the U.S. military has an entire core of people dedicated, I won't say to propaganda, but to public affairs, to putting things out there in a positive light. I have a friend who was a recruiter for the Marine Corps for 23 years. The number of people that he put into the Marines is astounding. Um, it's, it's a big monster. And I think, like what was said earlier by Ed, and I think Dave mirrored a little bit, is, is uh, I guess baby steps kind of saying, you know, you, you can't win the war, but you can win a battle. You know, if you can maybe make that one drone pilot call in sick today and question whether or not he wants to re-enlist, maybe that will make a difference and maybe it will add up. And, and the other thing is that, um, you know, we don't know much about tipping points. What leads to a significant change in the culture? Um, significant changes do happen, for better or worse. And we don't necessarily understand the dynamics of those tipping points. They could work in our favor, though often they don't. And it's only by a lot of us worker ants working toward that that there's going to be a tipping point uh, in, in, in our favor. I mean, who, who was the woman that was on the bus who refused to move to the back of the bus? I just answer that. Hmm? Rosa Parks. Well, there had been other people that had done the same thing earlier in Montgomery. But for some reason, the times were, and the chemistry was just right. That her act, humble and modest as it was, was a spark. And one spark. So we keep we keep we keep at it, plugging away at it. No, Martin Luther King, who's got now a whole uh, holiday uh, that some of us celebrate, right? Um, this is the 50th year anniversary of his very provocative uh, speech, speech on Vietnam, the year before he was assassinated, right? And he was never more unpopular in 1967. People hated him, right? He said, Martin, stick to civil rights. You know, stick to local issues. Don't mess with the military, right? That's not your game, yeah? And he said, look, my conscience drives me. You know, the beloved community, it might be the Viet Cong. What, what as a black man, you know, do I have against the Vietnamese people? Right? Nothing, you know? 
this is not my interest. You know, so at that point, oh, thank you very much. Um, he was able to connect all the dots, right? Of, you know, of, uh, you know, racism at home, settler colonialism, as mentioned earlier, right? uh, uh, racism abroad. Right? Who is being wrong, you know, after 1945, routinely by the United States? Mostly people of color. Yeah. Right, with the exception of Yugoslavia, right? <laughs> you know, um, for complex. Did you want to share some poignant notes from the film? Oh, about the <laughs> Vietnam, uh, Martin Luther King's speech. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, I think that was 67, mm -hmm. I was 10 years old, so. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was a tipping point for uh, people who were aware of the civil rights issues. Yeah. Um, and actually, a lot of uh, soldiers over in Vietnam, or if you were a person of color, you quickly you saw the utility of them. I mean, they were getting shot at and dying over there, come back here and, and uh, legal segregation. Um, what was your question? Oh, that's good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you Maybe. ever get a chance to right. listen to a speech, uh, you know, for my class, that would be a really good It's not highly publicized. And he was shot the, the next year. Yeah. Um, if I may connect these now to the modern day, uh, what happened to this jury that's decided oh. to set you free? Because, you know, Ed could, be, could have been in prison right now. He could have written lots of stirring letters to him and never benefiting from your wisdom. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I wanted to get to the consequences of some of our mm -hmm. actions mm -hmm. out of the Hancock Air Base. Mm -hmm. Um, I've lost track of how, 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 how many arrests there have been out there since 2010. It's about 200, a little shy of 200, I think. Um, and most of those have led to trials. Uh, and a lot of those have been trials by judges, you know, bench trials. Um, but we, we've had some jury trials too, in which we've both been found guilty and not guilty. Um, now, some of the sentences have been uh, for trespass, just the charge of trespass. You get the maximum fine, which is three hundred fifty dollars. Uh, you get um, in this in this particular court, um, Dewitt. You get um, so many hours of community service. And you get 15 days in um, Jamesville Penitentiary. Now, to be precise about the sentence, actually you get a third off if you're in Jamesville for good behavior. So I've been out to Jamesville, you know, two or three times, and now I'm out within the 10 days. Um, and as far as the $350 fine, well, a number of us refuse to pay it. And um, instead, we've sent our $350 fine to this peace group I was affiliated with in Afghanistan. I spent some time in Afghanistan with this group. So, you know, so far it hasn't come back to bite me after six or seven years. I mean, it might, someday, I don't know. But um, I'm sort of in a privileged position in terms of not paying fines because I've got very little income. So, that helps. Uh, so one of us, uh, or oh, another consequence is that the commander of the base um, has sworn out um, OOPs, uh, orders of protection, which say that if you go back to the base, you can be arrested, just for you know, putting your foot on the, on the base, um, because you're a threat to the commander. Now mind you, Hancock Air Base is surrounded by a fence, barbed wire fence, way taller than I am, guarded by men with guns, who've been trained to kill. And the commander is saying that we are a threat to him. Well. 
we're all, um, we've, we've all signed pledges of nonviolence. And we have an impeccable track record over the past seven years of, of living out a nonviolent ethic in, in our actions at the base. So anyway, um, my friend Marianne Grady from Ithaca, we, we've got some great activists from Ithaca uh, involved in our campaign. We were doing this action and uh, there were, oh, about seven perpetrators doing an action, blocking the entrance, including her sister. So she was doing media work. She had an OOP, so she knew that if she went on the base, if she joined these folks doing their action, I could get her into some deep doo-doo. So she, she goes over to her sister to get some help with the camera, and she's arrested. The judge who issued the OOP, the order of protection, took it personally, like she was defying him. She wasn't trying to get arrested. <laughs> it's very unclear where the edge of the base is, too. It was very ambiguous. She got sentenced to a year. Now, there was a hearing later. She served like 47 days. There was a hearing. She got out on appeal. It is still hanging over her. That one year. It's, it's now a six month sentence. Still hanging over. She's a grandmother. She has a small business. She's a caterer. Um, grandchildren. So she still could go to prison for um, having gone over, taken pictures of these, I think it was seven of our people doing this demonstration. The irony is that the jury found all seven. Anyway, so that, that's an extreme case. The other kind of extreme case of sentencing is Jack Gilroy from Binghamton, former retired high school teacher. Um, he got three months. Now, because of the two-thirds rule, he only served two months. Ago. Um, but a number of us have served out of you know, 15 days, reduced to 10 days. Um, we still have uh, trial. You saw the jury here. Oh, here's here's uh, Mary Ann uh, Grady being arrested, taken away. Uh, yeah. Um, when you talk about the nonviolent, you talk about order protection that would take that against you. Do you not see the downside of the negative effect of the psychological impact that you're having on the operators and the people that and and the basic anchor as well as with your kind of principles and, and religious kind of um, example that you're doing? Not having a negative impact on the um, trying to grow this movement because when I personally like I think a lot of what we're doing is um, educating other countries where they can hear that that is illegal. Um, but I just see um, from my perspective and a lot of my friends that are also against these policies, you're really deterring people from being involved because they see it as a joke and they see it as just kind of as like I said as a whimsical thing. Mm -hmm. And then when you're looking want to have an impact on the drone operators and the base personnel. But we how do you see we, we want them to think about I'm sorry? How do you see a psychological impact as nonviolent? Because you could be causing PTSD on the operators. You could be the direct cause of that. Yeah. I think when you look at causality, you, you 
got to see that we're, 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 we're the messengers. We're not the message. I mean, we're, we're carrying news about what this machine is doing to people in Afghanistan, Somalia, etc. That machine is always doing, also doing things to the drone operators. We aren't. The machine is doing it. They're officers. They're chaplains that say, oh, well, it's okay. It's a good cause. They are the ones who are doing the harm, I believe, to, to the individuals. So you don't think you're having a negative impact on the psychological You're not having a negative psychological impact on the operators. I think when you look at causality, like what is really causing their attacks of conscience, if that's what it is, it isn't our actions. It's bombing the bejesus out of people in other countries. If I started calling you I'd be dismayed at yeah, their... Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. When you're under a stressful situation, it's an entirely different situation. When you're here in a classroom, it's a very open and, and safe environment. Like mm -hmm. When you're in the military and you're out there and you're coming into work um, in a very stressful environment, I, I don't see how you don't see that, that that's a difference. Um, because these people are under orders and, and what, what you do to them has an impact on their life and their, their, their psyche. And uh, the way you're going about this just to me seems like you're, you're harming people when I don't believe your intention is to, unless you believe you're, unless you're saying your intention is to harm them. No, it certainly isn't. It's to make them wake up and to think about what they are doing, how they are harming others. And that, that's. Okay. What would you suggest? Differently, what would you suggest could be done differently? What would be a peaceful action? That's a good question. Uh, it was posed to me by uh, one of, a drone operator for a, a, a special drone. And I had to stand back from this for, for months and think about that question. It's a very good question. Uh, it could be causing harm to the people on the other side of the fence, but I was once the person on the other side of the fence. And uh, we, I, I joined right in the Vietnam, and we took a lot of ridicule. ridicule from them. And uh, you're right, it was a joke. We laughed at people for ridiculing us. And um, it, it, it is a very good question, are we doing harm? But um, what if we did? We didn't do anything. I mean, it, Ed Kinnan and I did not do anything. Uh, we're not raising any consciousness. But this, the, the classroom experience that you're doing here, I see as a, a thousand times more beneficial than some of the very whimsical and somewhat disturbing things that you're doing up in front of the states. Here in this classroom, this discussion, I think is, is just, I don't know if everyone's on knowledge on the situation, but these experiences, I think, are where you are going to have, have an actual impact and not be directly harming people in, in, in their profession, in, in what they do. Um, but a lot of the, the actual protesting up there, and, and, and like you said, if someone posed the same question to you, it, it, that to me doesn't seem like it's, it's, it's doing anything because policy is not made made in legislators that say higher up in the military is going to the White House. And it's the White House. And it's, I, I, I see you doing more harm when you should be focusing on the classroom experience and in these discussions in film, um, in videos that you put online, things like that. I see education being the, the way to, to change policy, not directly harming people that you're, you're just trying to because you're, you're, you're going at the, the tail end of it, the, the operators, instead of where, where these orders are coming from. And eventually it comes back to the people. Um, it's, it's, that's what this country is meant to be, drawn by the people. So here is the starting point, not, not working at the end. I, I see that just having a large negative impact on the people that really don't deserve that. Well, you bring up a good point. 
you know, a very good point. I'm an agnostic, so uh, uh, some of the religious aspects of what our group does really uh, uh, kind of turns me off. But, um, you know, and you're, you're bringing up a very good point. I remember the process, the, um, the arguments we had, and um, I mean, you have to do something. We have to do something. And you're right. We, I should be concentrating on military recruiters and you know keeping people from joining the military. But that's not a very popular thing. Um, and another reason why I do this is I live two miles from the air base, and drones fly over my house every day. So uh, in a sense, I'm a victim of these things. Um, and that really, uh, it started flying over my house last year, about a year ago, and that, that really solidified my resistance for it. Um, you've got a very good point. It might be harming the people on the other side of the gate, on the base. I was one of those people. And we used to get beat up. I was beat up twice, badly. Uh, simply because I was a sailor. And I still suffer from physical injuries, probably, but um, what's the alternative? Doing nothing? I mean, um, we go to a recruiting station and protest in front of the recruiting station, fine. But at least you all are here. I give you a lot of credit. You're here listening to us. And, but that is a good question something that maybe we should ponder. Uh, I've had a drone. Well, twice a month. No, I mean, the classroom setting. Um, discussion. Personally, not very often. Ed tours a lot and talks in various places. I think um, they're very valuable. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And as far as what, what can, why you continue, being arrested at the base, that's, that's a good question for you. Yes, So I'm going to oppose it. But let me. Uh, I was a standardization operator for Hancock Airport, please. Uh, you are a. The standardization operator uh, in 2010. Can you explain we, we what set, that means? We set up the program for the UAV and mm -hmm. Hancock. It wasn't at Hancock, we actually did it on 42 Patriot Way up in Rochester, and most people had a Shelby. We didn't have a corridor here yet. Uh, corridor, yeah. Yeah, we didn't have that yet. The corridor is made for training to get out of. Syracuse because you can't fly because the commercial aircraft constantly flying through Mendo. So what they do is they use the corridor to move it to a training area and then move them back. Uh, well, they're flying well, now out of the out of Syracuse drone. Yeah, you, you'll hear it. They, they, they move it. Uh, yeah. Last, when we were setting it up, because like, this is just like a theory, we were going to try to get it to fly up to like uh, the, the Great Lakes and just fly over there that way it fell out of the sky and fall into the lake. Yeah. Uh, I field tested in Afghanistan also, like uh, my unit did. And my thing with, because I agree with a lot of the stuff that people complain about with the uh, program, like I'm not a big fan of the, the targeted, uh, targeted assassinations, like just because of the fact that there was no due process for it, and a lot of people just view it as a video game, where oh, we'll just send the predator over. But I think with this, this gets focused on like, more than it should, because of the fact that Aviation is actually doing the majority of like the bombing missions. Predator has Hellfire, but even when we do Predator missions that the Air Force does, they'll have a Predator on site and they'll call in an Apache or they'll call in a Warthog or they'll call in some other bigger bird that actually has the payloads and can take out whatever target they're doing. The Hellfire isn't as really great for taking out targets unless it's like an open field. And then one of the bigger issues that comes with youth, not just drones in general, uh, is the fact that it's the policy we set more than it is the tools we use. So like when it comes to Afghanistan, where we have all these casualties, civilian casualties, it's coming from the civilian side also. The Mosul uh, hospital attack was a US aircraft. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a drone. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a predator or any of the other ones. The one that hit the other hospital in Afghanistan came from a Navy uh, gun. So we have guys on the ground who are making it. 90% uh, of our missions in country were surveillance, just, over, just eye in the sky to prevent guys in the ground getting hit. Most of it was uh, robbery con, where we'd go and make sure nobody's planning IEDs in the middle of the mm -hmm. night. 
and so that's why we use our thermals and we lock them on the ground. Uh, so most of our missions aren't combat, probably 1% of the missions that we do are combat missions where you actually see it. Most of our uh, aircraft aren't armed. There's no armament. Like uh, the last one we used had, the Hunter that we used had, they added it later on, and also like the medical kit payload, and that's what we kept there. The uh, smaller ones had no weapons payload. We called for fire on the ground. We kind of called the strikes in ourselves. It was the commander on the ground, whoever the battle captain was. So, when it comes to like, there's a lot of focus in it, and it comes down to like, when there's a new drug, like when uh, a couple years ago there was like a drug called Crocodile, that they were saying that was really just big menace and stuff, and it was really only, just because it was new and it was dangerous, everybody was like, freaking out about it, or the other one was uh, the wannabe weed, I forget what it's called. Casein. Yeah, that people are just getting sick from it. So people focus on it, even though like it's a small thing, and there's a lot, a lot of the stuff that's happening in the country is manned aircraft uh, missions, gun missions, the, the strike in Syria where we, uh, we took out a family <laughs> in the Syria mission uh, that Trump ordered the attack over there. I'm not I'm neutral on the whole thing right now. But um, it was a, that was another one from a Navy ship. Those are, uh, are they, uh, are they cruise missiles or? Tomahawk. Tomahawk thing from, uh, from Navy ships. So like the casualties on the ground were hitting civilians. It's not really coming from the hurt. It's just more of like, that's just known, and it's this new scary idea thing. That's it's really been around for about a decade, or actually now it's like uh, uh, more than almost that, twenty years. Thirty. Yeah, I was offered a job at the um, the cruise missile manufacturer. Yeah. Years ago. But like uh, a lot of our missions, we're not allowed to call for anything. We just do because uh, we can't get positive identification unless we have, like if you ever take your camera off a guy on the ground, you're not allowed to fire at him. Like if they, if you sit, if you saw Osama bin Laden, you knew for a fact it was Osama bin Laden in a truck, and we had permission to hit him. If we took the camera off that truck at any point and put the camera back on him, we could not strike that target because there's no longer any positive right And that's something the Air Force doesn't do because they are in the aircraft so they always have eyes even though they're using the same instruments as they are. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Are you divulging classified information? No, this is all open information. You can like find a lot of stuff. What happens when you divulge classified information? Uh, classified information is actual like, it's it's a crime. You can when were you separated from the military? Uh, 2013. So if you divulge classified information right now on camera, mm -hmm. what would happen? Uh, I'd go to jail. No, this is classified though. This is on ground. So this is all open source. I'm not what you're telling me is what we know. I can go online and find it. Yeah, it's all open yeah. source. But uh, do you think we know what? Uh, do you think, as a civilian, as a veteran, that I really know what's going on because I don't have access to classified information? The classified information, I don't even know what's going on with the classified information right now. Uh, I haven't been. I used to have a secret clearance. So. Yeah. And I, so I, haven't, I haven't been connected. This is also like the, this is not like, even specs and stuff for the aircraft are like open source. Now you can go like uh, right beyond and the other groups. And that's yeah. public information, but um, there are people right now called whistleblowers who are being pursued by the US government. And some of them had to move out of the country. Telling us right now, we might be able to find online. Yeah, you find online. Yeah, but uh, do we know actually what's really going on? Like in the world? Anywhere in the world. I mean, we, we uh, for instance, uh, there's airstrikes in Yemen, and we're not technically at war with Yemen. So, well, the, the airstrikes, in, that's another one. So, we, the bigger thing we're doing in Saudi Arabia is refueling Saudi planes, although we stop last year Obama stuff just at the end of the year. We refuel Saudi planes that we provided weapons for. And so then they're they're hitting civilians and stuff like they're basically violating all the rules that we have established for ourselves. What I'm trying to imply here is we're we're fighting covert wars all over the world. And the information you're telling me if we go online, it's if it were classified, it's not online, it's redacted. Do we really know what's going on? You mean beyond right. what he knows or I know or someone else knows. Right. Yeah, sure, there's lots of other stuff going on too. If we were to divulge it, and the, the, the CIA uses drones for a lot of stuff. Right. And most of their none of their yeah. stuff's gonna be online. So But most of everything the Air Force does or the Army, yeah, you can get all of that pretty easily. Probably ninety nine percent of their missions yeah. are pretty yeah. straight. Yeah. 
interest rate. Yeah, you know, well, that may be true, but the, I, I think the point is that the U.S. population in general knows very little mm -hmm. about what's going on, and I think our mainstream media isn't helping us to understand what's going on. Nor, for the most part, is our schooling helping us to think critically about what's going on. I mean, I think most most U.S. people, and maybe in every other country too, are, are pretty dumb about what the, the, the dynamics are of, of, a, um, of, of a military state. It's very complicated. Yeah. Most people don't have a lot of awareness. Not most, people, people. most people don't have a lot of awareness. A lot of awareness. awareness. But well, the information well, is there, and it's actually pretty easy to find. If you know what you're looking for. But anybody in this class who's had to write a philosophy paper knows the information's all out there, but it's a lot of damn research. You know, it's it's difficult to get the information, but not impossible, not illegal, and not yeah. unobtainable in 99% of the cases. But I think if we lived in a more functional culture, political system, our population wouldn't be dumbed down the way it is. And our mainstream media wouldn't be controlled by a handful of corporations who are primarily interested in profit, not in trying to raise the consciousness of our people. Can I add one more thing? Uh, this section here. It was not published anywhere in the Syracuse area mm -hmm. in the media. It was in the media blackout. Uh, Binghamton ran it, uh, other national organizations ran it, but there was a media blackout. So anybody in Syracuse, unless you drove by the place, you, would, you wouldn't know. The mainstream media isn't our friend in campaigns like this. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. That's why we have social media and do find uh, your action group on Facebook and chime in and continue the dialogue. And thank you so okay. much for coming. And Here's our website. Right, to be in touch. Thank you so much for coming. My email video. address. Yeah, and thank you, Al, for videotaping. Very welcome, as Appreciate. always. Um, and these were very thoughtful conversations with you. And I learned a lot. Thank you so much. If anybody wants to contact, I run this Facebook page. If anybody wants to contact me, and can I just make one suggestion? I could interrupt the ending there, but I think uh, the what can we all do with a lot of stuff is um, I'm older than some people here by a year or two. Um, so the people who <laughs> really, really understand social media, some of those older folks don't quite get it. Um, go to Facebook. If you think these folks are crazy, close the page. If you think after reading the, their Facebook page that they got something, Click like, click share, get the word out. That's how we avoid, or that's how we have the classroom experience in mass to a lot of people and get this kind of talk out there. You know, Al is probably going to put this online. Mm -hmm. Check that out. Like it, share it, comment, and so forth and so yeah, on. Thank you. And in other ways, I have a bibliography here. These are all um, books and films that I've read, seen about the drone issue. So I think it's real important that we educate ourselves. Now, you might prefer a different issue than the drones, that's fine. But if drones interest you and you want to become more knowledgeable and learn how to think about them, here's some really good sources. And you're welcome to take bibliography with you. And please, if I'm wrong, please contact me. Uh, good points you brought up here today. Good questions. Very good. Let's thank our presenter. By the way, this is within walking distance from my house. So. That's handcuffed. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well,